spiritually is I'm actually becoming more like God created me to be. I'm becoming the best that God created me to be. I become more compassionate, more merciful, more forgiving. And it just, because that's who God is. And I was created with that ability. So that's one way to gauge how you're growing spiritually. This morning, I want to look at another way to gauge how you're growing spiritually. And that has to do with how well you follow and lead. How well you follow and lead. And you do both. A mature Christian does both. So I'm not saying those of you who are leaders, I'm talking to you. And then those of you who are followers, I'm talking to you. There's no such thing in the kingdom of God. That may be in the world, but not within the kingdom of God. So we're going to look at how another way to gauge how we're growing spiritually. I also pleaded last night that if, if you're in all four lessons or two lessons or how many, however much you're involved in this, that at the end of tomorrow, you'll have at least one thing, one thing you're going to work on and grow in. And what did I say you're going to do with it tomorrow morning? Anybody remember? If you've picked that one thing by the time we take the Lord's Supper tomorrow. Right, because we're told, and I'm sure you've read this hundreds of times, 1 Corinthians 11, when you take the Lord's Supper, we're told to examine ourselves, and that's what we need to do, examine how well am I growing, am I, do I even have a bud yet, do I even have a flower yet, you know, how am I growing, and what kind of context is that? Now, I don't know about you, I don't have a green thumb, but I can't make that plant grow. I cannot make it. Can you make that plant grow? No. I can create an environment for it to grow. And unfortunately, I can kill it. Right? If I don't water it. But I can't make it grow. And I think that's also something we have to understand about spiritual growth. I can't make it happen. I can create the environment for it to happen. And I can kill it, but I can't create it. Only God creates it. That's why when we become Christians, we're told we're given the gift of the Spirit. And that gift of the Spirit gives us growth, gives us life. If I let it. That grows if I allow it, if I let it by giving it a good environment, giving it food and, you know, just creating the environment for it to grow. That's why it's so exciting to watch, if you're into flowers, to watch them grow. You just plant the seed or you plant the roses and then the next, you know, months later, whatever, all of a sudden the bush is full of these beautiful roses. I didn't do anything other than kind of create the environment. Every time you assemble to worship, you're creating the environment. Every time you're studying the Bible, you're creating the environment. Every time you meet in small groups as Christians, you're creating the environment. So if you want to kill your growth, don't meet with Christians in small groups. Don't study the word on your own. Don't attend Bible study and don't attend worship regularly. And I'll guarantee you'll kill your plant. That's a great way to kill it. Use every opportunity you can to be exposed to the kind of air that's good air for your spiritual soul. That's food for your soul so that you can grow. And so you'll see why this lesson is really critical because my growth is really dependent on my relationship with other Christians. We literally feed on each other. And after lunch, I'm going to talk about that, and that's in, Paul talks about it in terms of spiritual gifts. But we actually feed on each other. We're interdependent. We're interrelated. And that's what makes the ecclesia, the, the call, the people of God. God never intended for us to walk alone. He never intended for us to just be on our own. He never intended for any plant to just grow all by itself with no water, no rain, no earth. No, that it's interdependent with its environment and its context. And that's what's so beautiful about when the flowers do grow. It's saying everything around it, the whole ecosystem is doing well. It's in a good context. And so when we see Christians growing or when we see our children grow, 
it honors us because it said they're in an environment. The parents are loving and caring for them and they're with friends and they're doing the things that really bring joy in their lives. And you can tell it. You can just see it. You don't have to ask. You can just see the, the life. If you're a school teacher, you've seen also the opposite. When kids are in a dying environment, it's choking them. It's taking the life out of them. Many children have to go through things that child, a child should never have to go through. They lose their innocence early. A lot of things can happen. It's terrible. It kills the life that God intended us to have. But we know that in Christ, there is always hope. But again, I can't make it. Or do we all agree? I can't make it happen. I create an environment so God can make it happen. And that's why we honor God in our spiritual growth. By allowing him to work on our lives. Turn to 1 Thessalonians 5. I want to begin just reading the text. And then we'll look at um, some points in the lesson. And I will, I'm going to watch my time. So in 20 minutes, I will pause and we'll have some questions if you have any questions you'd like to ask so maybe in your notes there if there's something you want to ask about that feel free to jot it down and we'll have maybe a little bit of time to entertain some of your questions we think as best we know first thessalonians could be one of the in terms of the time when it was written was the earliest letter ever written it was even written before the Gospels. It's early, written very early. And here Paul had done his missionary travels. He's been to, he's now gone into Macedonia. He's been to Philippi, Thessalonica, Athens. Didn't go too well at Athens, but he really gave a good sermon that's, that's helped all missionaries everywhere. How do you preach the Gospel to pagans? <laughs> Thank God for Mars Hill. You know, the sermon in Acts. We know how to preach to pagans. You know, then he goes to Corinth and there were still pagans there, but it was a very mixed community because it was kind of the little bit of a New York City, uh, Toronto, whatever kind of city because you had, because it was on the, the coast, but you had people from the Roman Empire, you had the Jews there, you had the Greeks. I mean, it was a, it was a very mixed city. And in that context, the church did grow. It wasn't easy, but it grew. And fortunately, it was a, a disturbed church. I say that because I am so grateful for how bad the church in Corinth was. Because I've never seen a church that bad. So we know it's going to get better. And part of that is the truth of the gospel. It's true. It even shows you the dark side of it's not propaganda that only tells you the good things that happened in Corinth. You could have put it in three chapters. You didn't need two letters. It was one that had a lot of growth and a lot of struggle ahead of it. And Paul was concerned about it. So he wasn't trying to just say, oh, man, you come a Christian, everything's perfect. Every church is perfect. What's wrong with your church? No, here's a, here's a church that had about anything wrong with it, could be wrong with it, which, again, it, I've been in some churches, they thought they were bad, but it wasn't near half as bad as Corinth. So we still got a long way to go. Still got a lot, there's a lot of hope. So now Paul is writing, and this is the first letter he writes back to a church, which I think is quite interesting. What is your first concern? It's a fairly young church. Like almost every church he writes to, it has Jews and Greeks in it. I don't think there's a single mono-ethnic church that he ever wrote to. Had he written to Jerusalem, it would have been monoethnic. But every, every other one, it was mixed. People from all over the Roman Empire and even Asia. So he writes them and look at his concern. I mean, First Thessalonians, you just thumb through the first uh, few chapters. He talks about his ministry with them. He's reminding them of his relationship with them. He wants to see them again. He loves them. He shows that he cares. He's sending Timothy to encourage them and gets a report back from Timothy. Then he pleads with them to live a life pleasing to God. I want you to keep growing. Just keep growing and live a life pleasing to God. And he says, now, here's the reality. The Lord is coming. So there will be some accountability. So it's not like you have forever to decide you want to start growing. 
you know, there, there is a, a, a time that the seed will die and it can't germinate again. You need to grow while the Lord has been working in you and the Spirit has been in you. And so chapter 5, he starts talking about the day of the Lord. And then his final instructions is what I want to read. Because his final instructions is the best place in all the letters of Paul to talk about following and leading. Undoubtedly, the best place to go in Scripture about what does it mean to follow as a disciple of Christ and what does it mean to lead as a disciple of Christ. So follow along with me and I'm reading from the ESV. We ask you brothers, now it's translated brothers, but he's talking to everybody in the church. So it's brothers and sisters. We ask you, <laughs> okay, this is the Apostle Paul, right? He'd seen Jesus on the road to Damascus. He became an apostle, kind of out of due season. He could have said, as an apostle of Jesus Christ, and by the authority invested in me by God, I command you to blah, blah, blah. Paul didn't do that. Even as an apostle, he showed humility, and all he could do is plead with them. I'm not telling you to do this. I'm just asking you. This is for your good and the good of the church. So he said, we, at, we, we who? <laughs> well, it could have been the other apostles. could have been him and Timothy and Titus. Because you notice that even in 2 Thessalonians, it's Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. Timothy didn't, he worked as a, he was a team player. He, he worked with, actually he had 35 different partners. Yeah, in chapter, in chapter 1, verse 1, it's Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. So I think he's speaking for all three of them. He said, all of us want you to do this. We know you, we love you, and here's what we're urging you to do. This is something the church really needs there, and I think every church needs it. To respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Okay, that's a reference to leaders. What do leaders do? They show respect, sorry, followers show respect to the leaders God put within them in that church. Now, this is a new church. They don't even have elders yet, but they have people who've surfaced, who've taken responsibility for coordinating worship, for caring for people who are sick, for whatever it is. They're, they're taking responsibility. They're, they're kind of over them in the Lord. It's like they're your older brother. How many of you really deeply loved your older brother? Or older sister. <laughs> we had two girls, 18 months apart, and eight years later we had a son. So he was always grappling about having three mothers. You know, so he, and, and one was a good cop, one was a bad cop. <laughs> and it was like, they, they were always kind of telling him what he could do. What is like, I don't need an older sister. I'm glad they went off to college. Now I can do what I want to do. Then mom kicked in. <laughs> You know, it couldn't, he couldn't get by with just whatever he wanted to do. That did not work. Well, here he says, respect those who are among you and are over you in the Lord. What do they do? Now, as a follower, I'm going to respect them. I'm going to not always agree with them, but I'm going to appreciate one thing about them. They really are concerned about the church. It's not just about them. It's about the church. They're concerned about this church. They're concerned about us. So what are the three things that they do? Notice the three things. They're among you. They're among you. They're not in some office over in a major city sending orders of what you need to do. No, there's what Lynn Anderson called, they smell like sheep. They're, they're with you. They're one of the sheep. They're, they're not better than you are. They're among you. Secondly, and I, I think this is, this is a tough part. They're over you. How many of you like people who are over you? In a world, especially in the West, where everything is egalitarian. We're extremely rigid, individualistic, and egalitarian. We're all equal, and no one is going to be over me. So I want my own business so nobody can tell me what to do. You know, whatever, I can't wait to get out of school so I can do what I want to do. You know, whatever it is, we do not want anyone over us. Is there any advantage of having someone over us? Can you think of any possible advantage 
of having someone over us. What? Guidance. What? Guidance. Guidance. Yes. What else? Mentorship. Mentorship. Absolutely. You're on the right track. Just keep on going, brother. Because <laughs> my guess is you may have been in a culture where it was not a problem to have someone over you. It wasn't all egalitarian. And that's the challenge between East and West in a lot of times. Because in the Western culture, we've become so egalitarian. We forget heritage and history. We lose wisdom of the ages. We, we, we balk. We push back against guidance and mentoring. Because I can do it myself. We're told to be independent and do it on your own. Well, And there's a lot of good in that too. Up to a certain point. Why should you have to reinvent the wheel all the time? Why reinvent the wheel all the time? I have this. I've worked with a lot of elders all over the country. and In fact, in the world. And that for some reason, they will not write down policies. They want every eldership to reinvent the wheel and start from zero every time. When if we actually collected the wisdom of elders who've been elders for 25 years, had policies then that's passed on as new elders come in. They don't have to relearn all this and go through the same kind of mess that this group went through. But we never pass it down. I said policies. I didn't say laws. I didn't say creeds. I said policies. Here's the way we've done it that has worked. If collectively we realize that now it no longer works because things have changed, we change the policy. It's that simple. But when we don't have to think about every single thing, we don't have to spend hours and hours in meetings trying to work things out. Do you appreciate any of your habits? Do you know how important habits are in your life? If you didn't have habits, you would have to think about every single thing you do every single day. Do I brush my teeth today or should I wait till tomorrow? Habits are good. It's just have good habits. There are times they're interrupted, but I don't have to think about a lot of things I do. It's just good habits. Same thing with churches. We need good habits, and those are policies. That's how we do things. But we can change any of them, just like we can change a habit. Kind of hard. It takes about, what, three months to change a habit? <laughs> Probably six months if it's a bad habit. Takes longer. But we need that kind of guy. We need someone over us at times to really care about us. Isn't that how we were nurtured from an infant? Were our parents over us? They had responsibility for us. They cared for us. They protected us. They feed us. You know, if there's something wrong with having somebody over you, you just, I don't see how you can have humanity without parenting. Parenting is valuable and vital to growth. Same thing in our spiritual life. Who is parenting you in your spiritual journey? If you're a babe in Christ, who is parenting you? Who's over you to help care for you and protect you and guide you? We all need that. That's nothing embarrassing. There's nothing that should be a, a put down. It doesn't mean you're less than someone else. It just means when it comes to my spiritual growth and development, I need somebody to be over me and guide me. And then they say, Admonish you. <laughs> okay. That typically has a negative feeling, a negative sense, right? Do most of you think of admonishing as what happens when the policeman pulls you over and says, do you know you were speeding? Even his finger. Or when your mom says, you knew better than that, you're getting admonished. Well, could be some of that, but admonishing also has to do with challenging you to think about something that you're not thinking about that's probably not good. You're doing something you need to change and need to think about. And we need to be reminded. It's um, admonishing. Typically, it could be preaching. Preaching is admonishing you. It's challenging the congregation to do the right thing. So he says, respect those who are over you. So now you've already seen, first verse I've read, you see following and leading, right? 
We see things that leaders do in the church. We see things that followers do in the church. But it gets a whole, it gets better. To esteem them very highly in love because of their work. So those who are over you in the Lord, who are mentoring you and encouraging you and nurturing you in faith, it says just love them if, <laughs> because of their work. You don't even have to like them. He didn't say because they have a perfect personality. He said just because of their work. Look what they're trying to do. Love them. In fact, notice how he pushes it. Esteem them highly in love. You must really like them. I hope one of the things you may do as a result of this lesson, go to someone, if they're even here this morning, who have been over you in the Lord and have blessed you and leading you and guiding you. Thank them and tell them you love them. Thank you for teaching your class. Thank you for the time they spent listening to you as you were struggling with something. Let them know you love them and appreciate them. That will keep them going as well. Then he said, we urge you brothers. Oh, oh, one more. We urge you be at peace among yourselves. So what do followers do? <laughs> They're supposed to agitate for anything they don't like. You know, walk out if something happened they don't like? Or are they supposed to do something about the peace? Be at peace among yourselves. You know, the first thing that comes to my mind is we would take long trips, three kids in the back. Yeah, that's all I need to say. It's a 12-hour drive. We're, we're done. We're going home. They don't want to go home. They're tired, they're hungry, and now everything gets real sweet in the back, right? He touched me, she looked at me, that's my side of the seat. Anybody ever hear that? Was that just in our car? All right. Oh, on the way here today. <laughs> we got up too early today, huh? Yeah. And what happens in church? You know, I've seen grown adults who've been Christian a long time act the same way as my kids in the back seat. You need to go talk, as an elder, they'll come to me and say, you need to go talk to them because they did this and that and they're doing this and blah, blah. I thought, why don't you talk to them? I mean, it, it, just start, just nah, 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 nah. It's like, do you know what Paul said? We're supposed, if we're good followers, we're going to be at peace among ourselves. It doesn't mean that if there's issues that we ignore it, we need to address it, but just all the time, just because I don't like something, you know, grow up. Just grow up a little bit and realize, you know, we're going to have to have some flexibility here. We're not all from the same background, same culture, same traditions. But we all have a lot in common in Jesus Christ, just like they did in Thessalonica. And that's what he wanted to do. So what do followers do? Good followers live at peace among themselves. Then he says, I urge you, <laughs> brothers. Now notice verse 6, 14 does the same thing that verse 12 does to make sure you know that he's still talking to the same people. Who's he writing the letter to? Only the leaders of the church? No, he's writing to everybody. And now as he goes to verse 14, he's writing to everybody. So now everything that he says next applies to every single one of us as followers and leaders. And you're not going to like it. Just getting you a heads up. <laughs> we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, and only the elders have to be patient with everybody else. Oh, don't mess with Scripture, right? What does it say? I get so annoyed every time Paul uses the word all or every. It's like, come on, Paul, give me a break. Why can't I just be patient with most people? Be patient with them all. You're asking, what, what, you know, where did you come from? In fact, didn't you get impatient with the Judaizers? <laughs> you know, I think there was. There's some, but he's just saying, he's, he's raising the bar to say, I want you to be patient with everyone. All of you grow in patience. So can you tell whether you're making spiritual growth? The flowers start to come out. 
Here's evidence that you're making real spiritual growth if you have developed the ability to admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, and be more patient with your brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm guessing that in those four, there's got to be one that you're going to pray about during the Lord's Supper tomorrow. There's one that ought to carry over. <laughs> Pick one that you struggle with in order to be more patient with God's people because we can be so impatient. We'll say more about this in a minute. See to it, or see that no one repay, repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another. Here he goes. And to everyone. Seriously? I have to be good to everyone? Why not most of the time, or to people who are good to me? Why would he say everyone? Because Jesus died for all, especially those who were not good. Then he has... Here we go again. Rejoice always. Seriously? You know, has he been through the... Yes. I mean, this is coming from Paul. He's been beaten, shipwrecked, all this kind of... You know, if he, anybody's had a rough sailing, it's been Paul. And he still can come back and say, just still rejoice. Rejoice always because you're in Christ. There's a spiritual perspective of life that rises above all of the challenges we face in our earthly existence. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. Here he goes. All. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ for you. Do not quench the spirit because it allows the fruit, the fruit and the flower to grow. Do not despise prophecies. They'll admonish and test us. But test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. See how many times he used all, every, everything. He's, he's basically saying, it's going to take the rest of your lifetime and two more to get where I'm wanting you to go. Right? So he's saying there should, be never, there should never come a time in any of our lives that we don't need to grow. If there is, then you can say, oh, I'm patient with everyone. I have tested everything. I have discerned everything. And you're lying. You're being dishonest with yourself. So he's, Paul's perspective, as he's encouraging the church in Thessalonica to always be growing, always be learning, always be maturing in Christ. So let's look at some things that may have to do with this. Yesterday we ended with three observations about Moses. Because once he met God, he changed his life. Once he knew who his God was. Because God had to raise up a spiritual leader in order for him to do what he was asked to do. God didn't need someone to manage Israel as a board of trustees and a chairman of the board, what he needed was a spiritual, transformed example that others could follow. And then the kibbutz of God, kibbutz of God, the, the honor of God, became the reason that Moses wanted to follow God, and also the reason he wanted to lead God's people. So the reason Paul tells the church at Thessalonica to help the weak, and all the different people to tell them, why? It's so that we can all honor God better. So we can reflect the nature of God. Because when I am timid, when I am weak, then I am not walking close to God. The stronger I get, the closer I am in my walk with God. This came from uh, our discussion last night of Exodus 34. I encourage you to go back to that and just look at all those characteristics of the nature of God. So now, let me ask, what kind of follower are you? This, these are tough questions. How do you respond to those who are in authority over you? How do you treat the spiritual gifts of others? Because you see, when they use their gifts, they're leading. I'm following. How, how do you treat the consensus of a group when it differs from your own opinion? Uh, for 10 years, I was one elder in a church of 700, and we had 20 elders. 
Do you think we always had the same opinion to any topic that was discussed on Monday night, every other Monday night? <laughs> that was a growth process for me because I thought I was always right. Thank you. Some of you got that, man. That was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> we all come with such strong opinions from our own limited experiences. And when we find men who are mature, who have a very different opinion, I've got to stop and take a deep breath. Where is he coming from? And what, what is it that I'm not seeing? And we, we, we have to learn to even be at peace working through things ourselves. All of us are going to have to grow. All of us will have to stretch. Our opinion is not divinely inspired. The word is, but not us. How am I in, in following any leader? I don't care where it is, whether it's in your work, at school, at home, whatever. Are you good follower of any leader? And then do I even follow directions well? The, you know, here's the problem when people don't follow directions well. What does it mean? They're not listening. In order to be a good follower, I have to be a good listener. L listener. I have to listen to the instructions. You know, it's got to register. And then I go and execute it. I'll tell you the thing that frustrates a lot of elders and preachers. We will announce things at church. We will put it in the bulletin. We will do, I don't know how many times. And then somebody come up and say, well, nobody told me about that. It's because you weren't listening during the announcements. You wouldn't read the bulletin. Well, that's why you don't know. You're a bad follower. I, Eileen and I have probably taken 1,500 people on Bible Land tours the last 20, 30 years. We send out tips for travel. It's usually 10, 15 pages. And I can guarantee the majority of the time, the women who go will read it. And I know the men don't read it because when I get there, they ask a question that was answered in the tip for travel. And I get annoyed. I, I think when Paul said, be patient with all, he meant in the church, not on a Bible land tour. <laughs> and I will just tell him, well, I guess you didn't read the tips to travel, did you? Well, no. And they quit asking questions. They just asked their wife because she already knew what it was. I send it for you to read it. If you're not going to follow instructions, what kind of follower are you? Now, leaders have to communicate. And the number one criticism I hear of elders is they don't communicate well enough. Well, they're partly right. They need to communicate more. But why communicate when nobody's listening? So we've got to change that dynamic so we can all do better. Just remember the foundation of the Christian faith is following. That's what Jesus said. Sea of Galilee is my favorite place on earth. This is an aerial view of it. You can see the Mount Hermon in the top left. No, you don't know what mountains look like around here. <laughs> That's a real mountain they got over there with snow on top of it. And it was there. At the northwest corner of the Sea of Galilee, that Peter, James, and John get out of the fishing boats, and Jesus says, follow me. And he goes to a dozen people and says, follow me. And they became the apostles. And then they go around the world saying, follow Jesus. And they become the disciples of Christ. And now they've come to us thousands of years later, and we read the Gospels, and we follow him. Following Jesus is foundational to the Christian faith. So if you can't follow the normal things in life, how are you going to do any better with your spiritual life? So I know I am growing spiritually. I'm creating an environment for the flower to grow when I become a better follower. And in the kingdom of God, unlike the world, in the kingdom of God, good followers make good leaders. It, you, let me put it another way, if I'm not convincing you. You cannot be a good spiritual leader unless you're a good spiritual follower. It's the discipleship that gives us the foundation for our leadership in the kingdom of God. Jesus made that so clear in terms of what he expected. But in our world, it's different. Here's the ratio of books in Amazon 15-ish year, 20 years ago. There was somebody did research. How many books sold on Amazon are about leadership and how many books about following? 
120 to 1. And sure enough, I've been in homes of elders and preachers, and they're sitting around in their house or in their office, all kinds of books on leadership. I've never seen one that had a book on following. Oh, you can say, well, the Bible's there, but we don't do it. And the reason is, if I wrote a book on following today, you think anybody would publish it? With that ratio, they only publish books they can sell. They're not going to sell a book on following. Not in the West. They may sell it somewhere else in the world, but not here. A book on following? That would be an insult. Well, here's the numbers. In this survey, this was in 2004, 95,000 books on leading, 792 books on following. And that probably surprises you there was that many books on following. They're all out of print. <laughs> if I had time, I'd go through the Old Testament to look at the kind of followers God does not want. And when you think of the exodus and all the problems they had, you know, the rebellion when they said, let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. I mean, God gave them a leader in Moses and Joshua, and they said, let's choose our own leader and go somewhere else. That's the language of every church split I've ever seen. We're going to find our own leader and do our own thing, and about four out of five of them don't last more than three or four years. Because it was not of God. It was not blessed of God. But when there was a church plant that's intentional and God blesses it and he leads people and they go sometimes where they don't want to go, it's more likely to be blessed by God and bring spiritual growth. God's response to their rebellion, none of the people who have put me to the test these 10 times. Now, God was patient. Not only did he count to 10, he, he, ex, he, re, he tolerated it 10 times. But this time it crossed the line and he said... That's it. You will never see the land. And you know what happened? They all died wandering in the wilderness. The next generation got to see the land, although they didn't remember what their parents and grandparents did. God does not want, like in the uh, Korah rebellion, those who even came to Moses and had the nerve to say to Moses, you've gone too far. All the congregation is holy. We all know better than you do. Every one of them. And the Lord is among us. So why then do you exalt yourself above the assembly of the Lord? Whew, boy. That's the opposite of respecting your leaders. Did Moses want to be the leader? Do you remember the story? Don't you think everybody in Israel knew Moses didn't want to do what he was called to do? It was, I'm sure, in fact... My favorite quote of Moses was, this was not my idea. <laughs> this, was not, this is not what I planned to do. And they said, well, are you exalted? He wasn't exalting him. He was doing what God had assigned him to do. And as a result of that, you know what happened. The earth swallowed them all up. God was not happy with that kind of followers. And you can find time and again in the New Testament as well. The kind of response God makes to those who create division in churches, who are poor followers. That's just not spiritual maturity. You know you're growing spiritually if you become a better follower. Period. Wherever you are. To me, that is deeply rooted in the humility that Peter calls us all to clothe ourselves with every day. You have to be humble to be a follower. A follower of Jesus and a follower of his leaders. Here's the way I map out churches. And churches have kind of three different types of members. You could look at it in different ways. But there's always people at the core who provide the key leadership of a church. It's the, the Pareto principle says you have 80% uh, of the work done by 20% of the people. So if you have a church of 100 active, or 100 members, about 20 of them will be doing 80% of the work. And then you'll have active followers who will do anything you ask them to do, but they won't take responsibility. And then you have the passive followers who come, they show up, they won't bring any food for whatever it is, but they'll be here. They'll, you know, they're passive. And if you ask them somewhere in the grocery store, where do you go to church? Say, oh, I go to Central Church. Say, or, yeah, oh, yes, I'm a faithful member there. I go every Sunday. But when it comes to 
the life and the work of that church, they're passive. Now, there are some reasons to be passive. I want to make that clear. You can be ill. Some people are going a serious problem in their life. There's a sin in their life. There, there's all kinds of things that make people passive. And that should be the number one concern of shepherds. Shepherds. That's why you need shepherds in church. Those who are spiritually minded, who can walk alongside those who are struggling spiritually, or they're immature, or it's just a season in their life. They really need to be passive for a little bit, but then move on and grow and get involved. Now, I also have on here what I call in. These are your next. These are the network. These are your next brothers and sisters. If you have, let's take the 60 people that are really at the core. They, they're doing a lot of work in a 100-member church. Can you imagine the fact that nearly all of them will have four or five people outside the church that know them well in their network? It could be relatives. It could be people at work. It could be neighbors. All of us have a network of people way beyond just our relationships with people in church. If something bad happens at church, they're the first ones to hear about it. If something good happens at church, they'd be the first ones to hear about it. They're also the, the low-hanging fruit. They're the ones that you should be on your, on your concern for disciple-making. They're the ones that you want to introduce to Christ. They know you and know your life. Well, uh, my time is up. I've been having too much fun up here this morning. And I'm going to just go right through these points just quickly just to tell you in terms of active followers of Christ. If you're in those inner two circles, and I'll say more about it this afternoon as well. But if you're in, you know, you decide where you are. Chances are the fact you're here today, you're at least in those two the inner circles. If you're in a passive follower, I hope today will inspire you to grow spiritually and move, move into the life of the church. Get more actively involved. But here are the ways I define uh, active members, uh, and let me say the difference between an active member and a leader, two specific, three specific things. Those at the core of the church, and you roughly have 200, so you're looking at 50 people and 70 people on, as active. The difference is leaders will assume responsibility of a ministry of a Sunday school class, of children, of adults, teach a ladies' Bible, whatever. They assume responsibility for some. You can count on them. They'll be there and they'll do it and they'll take the lead in it. They also, the difference between an active follower and a leader is a leader can cope with criticism and a leader can manage conflict. So there are many people sitting there on the that middle circle, they can't go because they just can't cope with criticism or they just can't cope with, with managing the conflict that you always have when you have people together who don't listen to Paul when he says, be at peace among yourselves. They're going to be there. They are going to be there. And that should not keep you from doing God's work. But I can't tell you how many people I know who not only went passive, they were active, they were even at the core, they got beat up, they got uh, criticized, whatever it was. They could not manage it. They moved and moved, and finally they're not even faithful today. And it breaks your heart because they started, they were on a good path. But they didn't get the kind of mentoring that they needed of somebody over them to help them be faithful. So active followers submit to God. They use their spiritual gifts, which we'll discuss after lunch. They obey the leaders. They submit to one another out of reverence to Christ, Ephesians 5. They respect leaders and patiently help the weak, which we just took from 1 Thessalonians 5. They maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, Ephesians 4. And here's what is, I think, the most difficult thing to keep us from falling in your if you're looking at the handout, there's three blanks. Here, are the, this fills those in. But I think this is what, in, in my own life, I see it. Why is it so hard to follow? One is our individualism. We want to do our own thing. We're taught that, at least in the American home, and I think Canada as well. Second is consumerism. We're exposed to that all the time in the business world, in the marketing world. It's everything is for our convenience. It is not convenient to lead 
or be active in the body of Christ. That is not a convenience by any means. It's a commitment, but not a convenience. But it comes with great rewards. And sometimes it's just flat out sin. The sin of pride, sin of selfishness, whatever other sins that can keep one from being actively involved in the body of Christ. Obviously, I could spend all weekend on this one topic. I could spend all weekend on last night's topic. And I could spend all weekend on the topic after lunch. I'm just exposing you to it in hopes that one thing will reach out and grab you. And that over the next rest of this year, you will really commit to spiritual growth in one of these areas. In one of these areas. And you'll have someone who comes and helps you. If you go back to the... We sang a song just before uh, we started, and notice how these themes came, uh, I think came out in this song. If you can, they're going to bring it back up real quick, and then we'll, I'll turn it back over to Tim. Uh, precious cornerstone, you're faithful to the end. Can I yeah, advance it? Uh, I want to get down to the chorus. Let the... Honor of your name. Anytime you have the word name, it's, it's, it's one of the characteristics of honor. That was in Exodus 33. God's good name is how he's honored. Let the honor of your name be the passion of the church. Let the righteousness of God, that's his character, that's his honor, be a holy flame that burns. Let the saving love of Christ be the measure of our lives, measure of our growth. It's measuring our spiritual growth. As I'm loving Christ and the church and people, it's evidence that I'm truly growing from the inside out and the Spirit is lead, leading me. We believe you're all in all. If you don't believe it, you won't grow. If you will believe it, you'll go, why didn't we have this weekend a year ago? Or five years ago. I needed this weekend a long time ago because I really want to grow because it's the passion of the church. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Everett, for that... Um amazing talk and I'm still thinking about the stuff that you've said so I'm supposed to be give you announcements but my mind is still going Lot, lots of uh, ideas out there so uh, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have lunch now but please be back here at one o'clock and uh, if you guys are leaving today or when you leave make sure that your name tags go into the basket by the um, by the welcome table because we're gonna use it again like next year okay so just bring the take don't take these home Put these in the basket. We're not going to use them tomorrow. Um, so, yeah, name tags. And be back here at, is it 1 o'clock? What is the? 1 o'clock, okay, for the, third, for the third lesson of the weekend, the second lesson today. So uh, we are going to ask now Leslie Williams, our brother Leslie Williams, to please come up and close us in a word of prayer and to pray for the food that we're about to eat. Let's pray together. <clears throat> our God, our Father, we're so grateful that we can uh, come and be reminded of your glory and the role that we have, Father, to live to your honor. That we are to live to the praise of your honor as a church, as individuals. And Father, we ask for your guidance in that we ask for your discipline teach us O oh lord to be servants teach us O oh lord to uh, be humble and we do pray O oh lord that as opportunities are given to us to serve to share to minister to counsel, to give, to be gracious in all of these, Father. May you give us the courage to do it in a way that brings you glory. We thank you for every blessing. We ask you to open our eyes uh, to 
the abundance of what we have and the opportunities that we have. Give us wisdom to uh, uh, take advantage of those, Father, opportunities. And at this time for the food, uh, the hands prepared it, those who have been hospitable and worked hard, we ask a blessing upon them, blessing upon the fellowship that we have now. And again, in all things, may your name be praised. Through Christ, amen. amen.